Okay, well, why don't we just get started? I know um, Terry and Eric have lots of, of interesting stuff to talk to us about. So um, I want to introduce Terry Brady, who is a former colleague of mine when he was at Georgetown. Uh, and he is currently the technical lead uh, for, uh, let me get this right, uh, the technical lead for the Merit Digital Repository, which is the um, CDL's digital um, preservation system. And Eric Lopatin, who is the uh, product manager for Merit. And they're going to talk to us about some of the uh, work that they've been doing uh, around containerization. And they're going to describe some of the key technical challenges that uh, the system's working to address. And for one of the challenges, they're using Docker as a solution. And for other challenges, they describe it as container-ish. So uh, we will see what that means. So uh, thanks very much, Terry and Eric, and I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Leo. Um, so yeah, Terry and I are going to, uh, to trade back and forth uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, Thanks everyone for being here, uh, good to see you. And um, this is a little bit of information about Terry and I, uh, a link to um, Terry's work up on GitHub and our staff profiles, and a little bit of info about where we were before CDL. Um, but as Leah mentioned, we're going to talk about um, our use of containers and containerish, I guess you could call it paradigms towards uh, the application of uh, making the merit preservation system uh, a better system over the course of time. Um, so one of the probably the best place for us to start really is to talk a little bit about uh, the environments that Merit uses. Um, in other words, uh, the complexities that are involved there. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then get into some of our use cases and workflows. Uh, and then in the end, we'll um, talk about some of our current initiatives. So to hop right in, uh, Merit has multiple like tiers of uh, environments. So of course, we have our production environment, and Merit is, is as a repository, it's a combination of multiple microservices. So that makes uh, our lives interesting in terms of uh, having nine different microservices that are all interacting at once as new content is coming in. So some of those services take on ingestion, some of them take on replication to our different storage nodes, uh, some of them take on you know, storage, uh, the storage process, and also delivering content back out from Merit to any uh, integrated systems that we work with. Um, so in production, we have 24 servers and those nine microservices running all the time. Uh, they're high availability. In other words, um, you know, we'll have three or four different hosts that are all doing ingest, all doing replication, or all doing uh, fixity checking, anything like that. Um, and we have about 150 terabytes worth of data that's in Merit right now. Um, that's replicated over three copies. So um, we will have 450 terabytes to manage uh, one copy. The primary copy is at SDSC, um, the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is affiliated with UCSD. Um, and then we have another copy that is back east uh, being stored by Wasabi in their uh, Manassas, Virginia, uh, US East 2 data center. And then we have another copy up in Oregon, which depending on the collection could be an S3 or it might also be uh, in Glacier, uh, which is the majority of the, the time that the actual case. Um, and our EC2 hosts for all of the different um, servers are up in Oregon as well. So the stage environment uh, for Merit is you know, very close to what production is. We try to keep it um, nearly on par, it doesn't have quite as many servers, um, running all the same microservices and much, much less uh, data that's there. Although we have enough to play around with, um, you know, in terms of like being a proving ground for any of our integrations or harvesting or anything like that. Um, so then the development tier, we're, going, we're, we're kind of working our way down here uh, the development here doesn't, um, at least when I joined CDL about a, a year and a half ago, um, doesn't really exist anymore. Um, we used to have these servers that were around for development purposes where uh, when one of the developers on the team is actually getting into, you know, implementing some new functionality, uh, one of those ad hoc environments might actually, you know, at, at any given time be used. Um, it might be spun down for a little while, but uh, most of the times they're just kind of sitting around not being used all that much. 
Um, so, you know, given that our, uh, for example, our, our DevOps engineer has 44 servers to patch every month, uh, she has lots to work on there. And on top of that, the other services that, um, or applications that the UC curation team at CDL actually works on, um, having a whole development tier uh, dedicated wasn't uh, cost effective and it was a lot of maintenance and everything. So eventually it went away. Um, the notion, the first notion of containerization to talk, uh, containerization to talk about um, is with regard to that kind of development environment. Um, and here you'll see a note about volume, Docker volumes for persistence. In other words, um, if you have a stack, a merit stack that is containerized, um, it's really nice to be able to say, okay, well, you know, we want to know exactly where that data in the MySQL instance actually is. Like, you know, we, we'd like to baseline that MySQL database to a given state. Or, for example, we want to know exactly where we're starting in terms of the content that's in a particular storage node. So you can, we can do that from the get-go when a Docker container or a series of containers are, are spun up. Um, that's super handy in a development environment. Um, it's also super handy in a test environment for, for running testing and integration testing across all the services. Um, and you know, from that standpoint, uh, you know, you could see well, you know, we have an integration test that needs a given amount of data, a certain you know state in the MySQL database, all that sort of thing. So to be able to again baseline that to a known uh, known place is is uh, really important. Um, the last thing to mention here really is um, the you know this we have a way of managing all of our user accounts in Merit through LDAP and the roles for those people who, you know, either can see content or download it or add to collections. Um, we haven't containerized that yet uh, for any development purpose. And then we have our easy ID service for persistent identifiers. Um, all of our environments across Merit just use uh, the production easy ID service for, for minting new arcs uh, when new content comes in. Uh, next slide. So what really are the challenges requiring us to explore containers? Uh, again, the, the need for a development environment. We, you know, at, at, at UC3, we have, um, we have a few different teams and sometimes, you know, projects get slow. Sometimes there's a lot of work on another project somewhere else. Uh, and it's nice to be able to have, or advantageous for developers to move across teams and to, to be able to instantiate a whole new merit stack within um, an, an environment using containers, uh, you know, to have, you know, a new person on the team or a person who's moving to the team to work for a while, just have that, you know, all of a sudden available to them to start working with uh, is, is really great. Um, the, the need for the testing environment, uh, we have, uh, just one other thing to say about that, we have lots of unit tests across all of our code base, but we don't have a whole lot of integration testing uh, that's automated. Um, so that's something that, you know, we will definitely be able to take advantage of in terms of uh, containers. Um, I think the, the main point here, though, is the third bullet, really, is the auto scaling of our services. Um, there are times where, uh, you know, we, okay, yes, we do have three servers dedicated to ingesting new content. They only have so much like space to work with when they're ingesting that content. And occasionally we'll have a job that has, you know, 2,500, 5,000, 9,000 different new objects coming in, uh, which actually happened to us about a week and a half ago. And when that job hits the ingest service, well, one of those ingest servers or workers is basically busy for a few days. Um, and then, you know, that that one's out of, pretty much not out of commission, but it's no longer able to take on any new work. And then if that same thing happens to the two other ingest servers or something similar, uh, then we're at the point where the whole system kind of slows down. It's not as responsive to anybody who's trying to submit new content. Um, being able to add a new ingest server or add a new audit server um, doing fixity checking because we have a lot more content now um, and, you know, add another node or something like that. Uh, that is probably the basis for a lot of this work that we're going to talk about right now. Um, because it, you know, if you have a need for an, an extra server uh, or you don't have a need for a server and you can spin it down, that's also going to be an advantage. Um, so those, those are 
know, that whole all like auto scale idea here is um, is kind of like the focus for us. Um, you know, going hand in hand with that, being able to handle like objects that are over 100 gigabytes, uh, or being able to handle the ones that are like literally thousands and thousands of files within a certain object, um, those put certain stresses on the system. Again, some of them might some of those stresses might be handled by auto scaling or spinning up new instances of servers. Uh, so that's a part of the equation as well. Uh, and then being able to flex, like be, um, be able to deploy with flexibility or streamlining our deployments um, is something we'd like to also um, build into the, into the overall equation because we have all of those hosts that are working um, we need to be able to take some of them out of rotation while we deploy new code or you know, deploy new patches or that sort of thing. Um, and that becomes a really complicated process with this many, this many hosts in the mix. Um, so any way we can actually like streamline that through either you know, use of containers or that sort of paradigm where we're spinning things down. And overall that, that for example, that service is really stateless. Like in other words, you spin it down nothing happens to any of the work that's you know that's in process it can pick back up um you know when it comes back online and into the rotation that sort of thing um you know those are all those are being able to do that um is again very advantageous um the usage patterns here with regard to burst credits i don't know how many folks are are familiar with burst credits through aws but um, we have a central database in Merit that gets used by multiple microservices, and um, that database can get hammered sometimes uh, when, <laughs> you know, when when we're we're doing a lot of um, fixity checking across like thousands and thousands of files, uh, you know, and those, those all those require like uh, transactions with the database. Uh, sometimes these burst credits that enable that are really purposed for like enabling you to deal with a lot of traffic, they'll eventually get all taken out. And um, the system will kind of like slow to a crawl until the burst credits come back to us. Uh, in other words, Amazon decides, okay, you've gotten through enough tra traffic that, you know, um, things have calmed down a little bit. We're going to start giving you burst credits back. Um, that process takes several hours. So again, we don't want to see the system kind of like grind down to a halt just because of that. Um, and, you know, when it comes to you know how does this actually relate to containerization, uh, you can imagine that if we do have four or five different servers or th three or four servers that are all taking up a particular set of birth like credits eating through these credits, you know maybe we want to like slow things down and easily shut down two of those servers and then bring them back online, um, that sort of thing. Uh, it, again, it, it's all related. So. Those are some of the challenges that we're facing right now. Um, and then uh, I'd like to hand it off to Terry because Terry's going to walk through a lot of the workflows and kind of give you a visual element as to how everything uh, within the merit system interacts. So Terry. All right, so thanks. So I'm gonna kind of give some context to those different challenges that Eric mentioned, kind of taking a very simplified view of the merit system. So. As Eric mentioned, we've got um, LDAP, an LDAP server that's used for um, authentication and authorization to different collections. We have a Zookeeper queuing system to queue our ingest workloads. We have a MySQL database uh, for um, sort of managing metadata about our objects. And then we make use of three different cloud storage providers, S3, San Diego's uh, Minio service, and Wasabi. So, those are kind of the core components. And, and what happens in the merit system is we have a user interface. Uh, from that interface, you can initiate an ingest into the system. Content's uploaded. Our storage microservice persists content to cloud storage. And then once uh, an ingest is complete, our inventory service registers the uh, addition of that content into our MySQL database. Um, once content is loaded, our replication service pulls from one cloud uh, storage provider and replicates the content to um, all three cloud providers. Our audit service just continuously goes through and pulls all three content and all three cloud providers and does fixity checking on the content to make sure it's, you know, actively uh, having its integrity checked. And then sort of I'm repeating our storage service because on the delivery side, 
the storage service then brokers requests for content to be displayed through our user interface. We actually have more microservices. We do have a sword uh, interface and OAI interface, but just for simplicity, I'm gonna focus on kind of these core services um, over here on the left-hand side. So the first challenge Eric talked about was, you know, kind of how do we build a development environment? So this is a view of um, how we built up a development environment using Docker containers. So um, the components I have uh, colored in purple here are where we took sort of off the shelf, um, published Docker images, customized them a little bit and made them available for merit. So we have a Zookeeper image, a MySQL Docker image, and actually Minio uh, has, provides a Docker image, which allows us to sort of mock cloud storage um, operating in our environment. We also have a legacy way of storing content in Merit uh, that is file system based. Uh, it's called pear tree storage. And that is another function we can, we can take advantage of um, in our storage service to sort of simulate different kinds of um, content storage within this Docker stack. Um, <coughs> and we make use of an SMTP service for sending um, email uh, at the beginning and end of um, content ingest. So the key thing is these three components are MySQL database, our pear tree storage, and our Minio storage. This content is persisted with Docker volumes. Um, and just to give you a little flavor, I wanted to um, show you just uh, at a high level what our Docker configuration looks like. So here you'll see I've got a, a Docker compose file and we've got an ingest service uh, built, uh, a UC3 merit ingest service. We have um, a storage service that we build again with our custom code. The, um, our ingest service and storage service are built off of a Tomcat Docker image. We have our inventory service also built on Tomcat we're making use of, we've slightly customized a published Zookeeper image for our purposes. Our user interface is built on a Ruby on Rails uh, Docker image. We have a MySQL um, database container that we've worked into the mix. And then um, SMTP and the last one I'll highlight is we've got a Minio container for um, simulating cloud storage. And then as an extension of that, Docker configuration. We also have um, the ability to persist the, those three components I mentioned as Docker volumes. So we can take our pear tree storage, export that um, to a Docker uh, volume. We've got our MySQL, we persist the content and then the Minio content as, as well. So this allows us to restart the Docker stack and still have some content present uh, within the container and my Zoom controls are getting in my way. Let me uh, switch back. And if, if, you're, if you find yourself really curious, I've got a um, presentation you can click through that kind of goes through uh, what we created in more detail. So now I wanna step through some workflows um, within Merit and highlight some of those challenges that Eric mentioned. So the first thing is I'm, I'm illustrating what happens when a user comes and logs into our Merit user interface. So from their browser, they connect to our user interface and they authenticate with LDAP. Next then we uh, use content in the MySQL database to present a navigable view of our um, collections and the objects inside of Merit. A user can then initiate an ingest. This posts uh, data about what the content to be ingested into Zookeeper. The, then our ingest service comes along and reads um, tasks in Zookeeper and begins to ingest content using our storage microservice to persist content to cloud storage. And one of the things I wanna highlight here uh, that's a particular challenge is, you know, because these packages that we're ingesting can vary in size, it's actually very difficult uh, to load balance and redeploy our user interface, our ingest service and our storage service, because we need to, um, we, 
you know, some of these tasks can run for up to 24 hours. So it makes it, we've had to choose Apache load balancers over some of the AWS load balancing solutions in order to support these long running operations. Also, we have to sort of pull log files to confirm that a service has completed work before we're able to redeploy it. So that's that's a challenge we're, we're eager to tackle and address. Um, after an ingest is completed, we uh, pull a manifest from Zookeeper and log the ingested content. Uh, using our inventory service, we uh, capture that information into MySQL. Then uh, our replication service um, comes along and picks up new content and actively replicates it uh, from one cloud provider to the other cloud providers. Our audit service pulls the content in the three different cloud providers and does fixity checking on that content and uh, saves the results back to our MySQL database. And then the, lastly, I'm showing our storage service coming into play again <clears throat> when content is requested through the user interface. So a user requests particular content, we ask the storage microservice to provide that content. And at least up until a few months ago, what we would do is we would stream the requested content through the storage service, through the user interface and deliver it back to the browser. So, but one of the, uh, and similar to the ingest side of the workflow, we had to account for potentially multi-hour downloads that were taking place uh, to satisfy user requests. So one of the first improvements, and th this one actually is in production, whereas m many of the other um, solutions I'm gonna talk about we have yet to tackle. But what we did is we made use of pre-signed URLs to simplify the delivery of content. So rather than streaming um, digital files through our components, what we do is our user interface asks the storage service to generate a pre-signed URL for content. And then we deliver that pre-signed URL to the user's browser and the user downloads the content directly from cloud storage. So that has already simplified the redeployment of the storage servers that we have in place for delivery of content. Now, the next thing we're eager to do is make use of pre-signed URLs for ingesting content. And the way that this would work is a user would initiate an ingest through our user interface. We would then generate a pre-signed URL to a separate uh, bucket of cloud storage, uh, calling this an ingest bucket. And the user would then post their content directly into the ingest bucket. So again, that content wouldn't flow through our servers. It would be sort of a connection in between the end user and the ingest bucket. From there, then what we would do is we would kick off our existing ingest workflow, but pull the content from the ingest bucket rather than streaming it up through the user interface. So that's one improvement we're, we're eager to make. Um, you know, one of our hopes are then, you know, if we are able to eliminate these long running IO streaming operations from our servers, we could then migrate the load balancing for all of these applications to using AWS load balancers. And our goal really is to say, when we wanna deploy new code, we just sort of like working with a Docker container, we just create a new instance and deploy it. Right now, what we have to do is we have to carefully shut down one running server, replace the code, carefully bring it back up. What we'd like to do is kind of almost think of each of these microservice code bases as something that we can destroy and recreate as needed. And then ideally also get into that um, auto scaling Eric was talking about where we can, you know, flexibly uh, increase and decrease the number of service instances that we have. Uh, some other work that we need, we would like to work on is um, all of our services that pull content from cloud storage, we'd like to implement some queuing and uh, prioritization to manage our workflow. So, you know, when we check some content, we've got a multi-threaded process that's, uh, you know, running a, 
IO intensive checksum on all this content. And what happens is if we get two threads processing incredibly large files, then you know our some some of our services can become uh, fragile or get into trouble. So we'd like to make sure we're being uh, smart about how much work we take on at any given time. Uh, some other initiatives we're working on are trying to think again. This this is this falls in that category of container ish that we talked about. We would like to take some of our operations that are really discrete tasks and make use of um, serverless deployment technologies like AWS Lambda. So we have built some backend tasks using uh, Lambda so far, and we think it it could be particularly interesting as a way of simplifying some of our existing microservices. Similarly, what we would like to do is we, we currently have kind of sort of an API that runs inside of our Merit user interface. We'd actually like to make that a first class API, again, implementing that as a serverless function. And then what that would allow us to do is deprecate our SORD and OAI services, which really just, um, have become kind of cumbersome and, and not provided the flexibility that uh, we would like to have within the system. And so kind of, you know, like this, this we're, we're sort of seeing is maybe our next year, maybe more than our next year of goals. We kind of see all these tasks as um, interrelated, but we're sort of eager to, um, you know, work on all these things to make things more resilient. And I'll turn things back to Eric here. Yeah. Um what Terry said, um, you yeah, know, basically um, a lot of these things are interrelated. Um, a lot of these things are about not only improving the system, but making it more manageable uh, and making it more, um, you know, resilient. So, uh, you know, with re respect to the, you know, the experience we've had so far with, uh, for example, pre-signed URLs or also like starting to work with Lambda functions, we can, we're gaining some insight into how, you know, this work will, will benefit us in, in the future. Um, you know, it, with, with this many servers that are sitting around, um, you know, it's not completely unmanageable, but uh, again, when, when you're at the point where a lot of them have their, are, are eccentric in one way or another, their configuration or their, uh, or, or the manner in which they have to start up, that sort of thing. Um, you know, they're, uh, at, as, as the typical phrase goes, uh, they're, they're pets, they're not cattle. Um, we have to take care of them in a way that we shouldn't necessarily have to take care of them. Um, although, yeah, I mean, cattle can be pets too. But um, yeah, and overall, uh, you know, the, um, the work that we need to do is all kind of it's it's going to contribute to these kind of interrelated uh, parts of of uh, you know a, a containerish approach uh, to making the system uh, more resilient. Um, yeah, the the couple of other you know things to to mention uh, before we wrap up are um, you know this this notion of uh, container orchestration. Um, you know, it, if we get to the point where we're actually running certain microservices in containers, um, you know, we could have an orchestration layer on top of that, which would literally, you know, further streamline uh, our patching processes, our deployment processes um, through that layer, something like Kubernetes or whatnot. Like uh, that would be that would be a long term goal uh, in terms of, of managing the system overall not only from you know an update perspective but also from that auto scaling uh, perspective as well um, yeah i think um i think that wraps that up terry do you want to add anything else on this slide or nope i think that's that's summarizes it okay um so we we wanted to kind of open it up to to questions we we do have a small series of questions for everybody on the call um, that we that would be great to get into. Um, but before we start asking those, uh, are there any questions off the bat about the presentation so far? Well, if other people don't have a question, I um, I have never worked directly with containers, so I'm still it's still such a theoretical kind of thing for me. I, it's hard for me to really wrap my head around exactly what it means, but um 
I'm assuming that Merit, the, the end user for Merit, are the librarians and technologists within the libraries of the UC system, right? Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, for, for the most part, um, you know, the folks that are interacting with Merit are from across UC. Um, they're also, you know, at, at different campuses, there's, you know, this, you know, they're in terms of using like um, dams or something that, you know, mm -hmm. that we can integrate with to take some of the overhead of like maybe absorbing some of the updates they make to their local, you know, curation efforts and making sure that those, those changes get captured. Uh, in the preservation element, um, you know, so those are like direct integrations that we might be working with in addition to folks um, submitting content directly. Um, I would add though that um, a, a major integration that both goes within UC and external to UC is, is the Dryad re repository. So, you know, it's a multidisciplinary repository for data sets, um, you know, about a year and a half ago or, or a little bit more, um, you know, CDL and Dryad partnered. And so um, now all of those data sets that are coming in from, you know, uh, outside of UC for all the researchers that are submitting to Dryad will also, they also flow into, uh, into Merit. And then, you know, that's a major source of traffic for us, not only incoming, but outgoing. Uh, so when folks request um, downloading uh, an object or individual file from a data set, um, a lot of that traffic is that we see every day is being generated by by Dryad, both internal to UC and external to the rest of the world. So given that, I'm wondering if in any of this work that you've done in terms of Docker or other containerish solutions, if your end users actually experience any difference or is this so far behind the scenes that they would never see any changes? Well, certainly for the, the Dryad folks, when we implemented our pre-signed URL uh, for downloading content, they cord it, they, you know, we gave them an opportunity to migrate their requests from a traditional download to a pre-signed uh, URL request. Uh, we've recently updated the RSS feed within the Merit user interface to um, use our pre-signed URL downloads rather than download. So, so there are some changes. The goal is to make it um, as simple as possible. I would say, uh, particularly here in this diagram, once we do introduce this API, we've had uh, some of the campus partners who contribute content to us have, have wished for API functionality. So uh, we'll, we'll be um, able to provide that. Also the Dryad integration is the, the primary user of the sword and the OAI interface. And those have just, you know, while, while they were um, a great idea for um, abstract integration, at least the, the implementation we have of these two services right now is, isn't flexible and isn't kind of in keeping with everything you can do in a, a cloud computing environment. So, I think they'll be eager to migrate to like more of a first class API. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, yeah, I think I, can, uh, oh, hello. I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to um, quickly mention that, um, yeah, one, one of the other workflows that has been positively impacted is um, uh, when it comes to actually obtaining uh, large objects from, from Merit, there used to, there was, as of, let's see, throughout Merit's history until about four months ago, there was this, um, the workflow where an email would be delivered to um, the user, the person who requested that large object once the object was ready to download. And the problem was is that email was not actually getting to certain domains to certain researchers um, just because the email was blocked. And so now we don't have to use that anymore because if, at least, for example, in the case of Dryad, um, we have a, a a polling mechanism that's in place where Dryad can basically go back and say, is this object ready yet for download? And then the user can be can be in the interface and basically see, okay, well, um, you know, this thing is not ready yet. I'm gonna come back and when it's ready uh, based on their account, then they can actually download. And they don't, we don't have to worry about an email being delivered or not delivered. Great. Um, so I was wondering, could you discuss why you went with Docker rather than with another containerizing system, like just say LXC directly? 
So I think for me using Docker just because it's it's uh, something that I knew it also then is is available to be run from anyone's uh, on the development team's desktop. Um, so I think it's it's kind of familiarity and and uh, flexibility of where we can uh, run those Docker containers. I think we initially had more of a a vision that we would be like trying to um, migrate things towards uh, orchestrated Docker containers with Kubernetes, and I think we were realizing we got we got lots of um, interim steps to go through before we even even try to go there if if that ends up being a place we decide to go. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Actually, I'm seeing that, that somebody put into chat some questions for you. Um, yeah, looks like we've got a couple kind of related. Um, Dan. Yeah. yeah, I can I can speak that too if that's easier. Um, so it looked like a very, very big dev stack. And we do some similar stuff here at the library and have just noticed some performance issues when developers were working locally. I'm wondering if you see that with your developers, do they actually spin that up on a local workstation or are you doing it in a cluster? So I, when I'm making changes to our user interface, I can pretty effectively um, test that uh, just from my desktop when we need to, uh, particularly if we need to test both Merit and Dryad together, that just is on, has become um, impractical from a desktop. And then we, what we do is we launch uh, an EC2 with all of these Docker containers running. And that gives us a little bit better performance. So I have a question, not unfortunately about Docker, but actually about your fixity checks that you said that you do with the audit. So do you perform fixity checks at all, all three locations or just on the SDSC instance? We, do, we, do, we don't do it for Glacier, but we do it for um, all of the other providers. So there's a, a database that just keeps track of um, how long it's been since each copy has been fixity checked and then you know, eventually it, it's prioritized into the workflow and, and goes through and uh, that fixity check is run. Right, and as, as we um, actually brought the, the third copy, the Wasabi copy online, um, that was one of the causes, of course, for uh, the additional uh, fixity checking servers that we have running. Um, and they're actually also uh, very, um, when they start up, they're very burst credit greedy. Um, so actually very database transaction greedy. So um, that's one of those things where we've had to, to watch out uh, again as, um, as, for example, after deployments or patching or something as those servers are spinning up, we need to keep an eye on things. I think right now, uh, I, when I last looked, our audit service was, uh, you know, particularly because we've created this new third copy, I think our audit service was lagging about three months behind um, additions of content. So, you know, if we determined we needed to catch up more, we'd need to run uh, more servers or, you know, we kind of decide, okay, stuff is getting actively checked often enough and we're, we're comfortable with um, the, the process that we have in place. Any other questions yeah. folks have? So uh, this, this is Matt. Um, real quick, I'm just wondering, because you mentioned it right towards the tail end of your presentation. Um, can you tease out a little bit um, more what the relationship between uh, things like Docker and things like uh, Kubernetes is? So we, Kubernetes would allow us to, is, is an orchestration layer for Docker containers, and it. The, may, I don't know much about other container types, so I do know though it it, it will, uh, you know, control the number of instances of each container you have, and perform health checks, and and sort of ensure that all of the services can talk to each other. I think we have several hurdles to go through before 
we are running um, any Docker containers in production. Um, so, you know, I think if we hit the point where we decided to take some of these, so each of these boxes right now are EC2, uh, Amazon EC2 instances. Uh, in the presentation I showed, we might replace a couple of these with some serverless Lambda functions. But if we got to the point where we were comfortable replacing these actual server instances with Docker containers, then we might want to consider something like Kubernetes as a control mechanism to make sure that all of the instances could talk to each other. Um, right now, since we only are using Docker containers in a development environment, and hopefully soon in an automated test environment, you know, they, they're just, um, we're making use of Docker Compose as our orchestration layer, which is a much, much simpler um, mechanism for controlling the interrelationship of different containers. And it's sort of, with Docker Compose, you're, you're presuming you're hosting all of your containers on one common server. Whereas if you have something like Kubernetes, it can actually span your Docker containers to run across multiple hosts. Yeah, that's great. Super helpful. Thank you. A little follow-up question about that. So given that your development environment is containerized and your production and testing environments are not, are you worried at all or have you tried to address keeping the provisioning in sync between those two or does that part of the stack just not change often enough for it to matter? I think it's the, you know, we, we've got this stage environment that Eric talked about that's sort of, you know, a subset of our production environment. So when we need to do any sort of sophisticated integration testing, we still heavily rely on that environment to be sort of the, the preview or the, or the staging area for changes that are being released. Um, we tend to use the Docker environments really for, I, I'm working on one very specific um, change that I wanna test and I just don't wanna break or interrupt any work that anyone else is doing. So um, it's, I think right now I'm, I'm heavily using the Docker environment because I'm comfortable with it. I think a, a goal will be, you know, can, can we get to the point where more folks on the team are actively using it as the first step of testing content? Because we're, we're, we do end up with a bottleneck in this staging environment where sometimes we're, you know, trying to do too many things in that one fixed environment. Gotcha. Yeah. So it sounds like you still have the gate at the deployment of the staging pipeline or the staging environment. Um, out of curiosity, how are you guys deploying that environment? Is that automated through, you know, Jenkins or like, is that fully automated or is someone going to the server? So, so we do have Capistrano to help us, but we do actively go and sort of push code out to that environment server by server when we do deployment. So yeah, we don't, we don't have a, a, a way of saying we're going to automatically rebuild the system. And we, that, that's the thing we're sort of almost imagining as an automated test environment to say, go and, you know, grab the latest version of code, spin it up into an integration test Docker compose stack and run some level of automated testing there. I think that's, that's like a next goal for our Docker setup. Um, this this is Matt again. I've got a, a question about um, like where this this work goes uh, in community here. Like so, um, we've got a de decent swath of uh, NDSA institutions that are um, you know either actively you know engaged in similar development or maybe kind of at the doorstep. So given that uh, we're kind of in this uh, <laughs> this unending uh, open ended uh, virtual connection mode right now, like what, where all are you looking ahead to, to engage the rest of the community and, um, you know, connect with other institutions that are, that are doing similar level of work with this, um, help each other out. Yeah, I guess I would say that's kind of a good segue for some of these uh, questions we had. It's just curious of, you know, do these sound like familiar challenges that um, other folks are facing and, um, you know, how, 
you know, how, how embracing of the idea of containers or, or other folks being. So we sort of backed away from containers to saying container-ish as we put this together. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there's the, the notion of finding out what the, the community is, uh, you know, is, is up to and um, you know, where are some similarities or other analogs that are out there? Um, I think it's also, it's also um, you know, interesting to see, uh, you know, the, the pro any project that spins up in the future, um, you know, that, that will be able to take advantage of this sort of thing, um, whether it comes in through uh, one of the campuses or, or external, maybe in the state of California or, um, you know, beyond that. Um, you know, for example, there's a, a project that uh, we're, we can, we're engaging with through UCLA right now, um, but it actually invol involves um, uh, the Palestinian Museum for um, digital ephemera that they have. And we need to figure out how to get that content uh, from their S3 containers uh, or S3 buckets all the way to merit. And so the, um, the notion of using like a pre-signed URL that way um, for ingesting is, uh, is an idea there. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we'll have that con that actual you know functionality in place, um, but it's you know it's another interesting problem um, and way of trying to um, you know uh, figure out how to put the pieces together uh, that'll directly um, help folks that are interested in, in using the repository. It's a, a very specific example, but you know there are other projects that I'm sure will come up. Are there any other questions off the of bat, or uh, we can? Um, we don't have all that much time left, but uh, we could go through some of these. Um, and I, I wasn't sure if there was there was other um, other typical things uh, you all wanted to cover, um, Matt. We have like in the last ten minutes of the meeting or anything. Um, no, there's not ten minutes worth. Maybe there's a couple minutes worth at the end. So. Uh, if you if you uh, want to go through these questions, I think that's fine. Okay. Um. Well, one of these questions, uh, you know, having well, we were talking about containers already, but we're also curious to find out um, if other folks are using uh, AWS Lambda functions at all um, for, you know, specific operations or anything through through their um, through their repository. And put that one out there. So we'll say that we are not using Lambda functions, but we do have a lot of containerized, um, what used to be called scripts here, things to move data, launch data, process it, um, that we now run with Docker Swarm. So that's our sort of poor man's version of AWS Lambda running on site. Yeah, we one one interesting thing we found is we uh, built our first Lambda. There's a um, AWS lets you put something called API Gateway in front of a Lambda, so that's designed for. Uh, I, I think it provides some sophisticated services for having a, you know running a and public facing API, and they have a hard and fast um, thirty second limit, uh, so any function that is called from API Gateway has to provide a response within 30 seconds. And what was interesting was after we encountered that challenge, we realized, oh, there, there are a couple components of uh, Merit that as we redesign this, we'll, we'll definitely be able to, um, you know, th they'll sort of conform within that constraint. And then that just had us kind of thinking, oh, okay, maybe, maybe that particular component is a good uh, solution to think about serverless functions. And you know, the, the advantage being there, if something's running serverless, we don't need to worry about maintaining the underlying compute server. I'm sure, I'm sure there, are, there are other challenges that come along with serverless, but that's one, uh, one challenge we um, don't have to uh, contend with.
And there was another note from uh, from Dan saying, um, you have containerized a lot of old processing scripts, which we run in our Docker swarm. It's better than the old script on a server, but we don't have the fancy event uh, eventing system you get in AWS. So we, yeah, we, we, well, we definitely also have those uh, old script on a server cases to deal with as well. Um, you could say that um, we're trying to get to the point where a lot of it, like the, for example, this, uh, the tooling that, that Terry is mentioning, um, where we started to experiment with Lambda functions um, is actually, because it's something internal to the team, um, it's actually replacing some of those scripts um, that uh, that were around um, on certain servers. And so now, uh, because those, for example, those scripts weren't run all that often, they did, didn't really deserve their own EC2 instance. They were kind of like piggybacked onto something else. Um, now we can basically run those uh, with the equivalent functionality uh, whenever we need that. And uh, that operates through the Lambda function that way and through the API gateway. Um, but yeah. I think Eric and I are both, you know, relatively new to the Merit team. And I think, I, you know, I certainly know that I've, I've wished to have like a single um, web page that uh, could make every existing service and every existing sort of one-off script kind of accessible to me easily. Uh, just, just to help me mentally keep track of everything that's going on. And so that's a, uh, a thing that I think is as as we think about replacing scripts with lambda functions, then you know we also have ways I think to to make those um, easily discoverable and understandable by folks, particularly new folks on the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you found all of this? Uh, this is Madigan. Have you found um, all of this development work and housekeeping and you know migration? These things you're touching on uh, a bit easier to do in recent times. Uh, given some of the the changes and a lot the ramp up of remote work, or um, has it gotten more complex? Um, I would say it's. Uh, I think we we've got a great amount of support, like from our infrastructure team, mm -hmm. that you know just the notion of like exploring serverless functions. We've had a lot to figure out, but the assumption is, um, you know. If we can, if we can migrate a bunch of things, eventually we should save some money because we've got we, I think we've got some over provisioned servers that you know are are necessary given our current configuration, but they're not being used as often to, you know to justify that cost. Mm -hmm. But then you know we also have spikes where you know we're we're under provisioned, so a lot of this hopefully will just get us to a place where we you know can eventually have just the amount of compute we need for the, the workload that we're trying to process. Tim, Tim's got a question in the chat here too. It says AWS is a big dependency. Uh, your storage seems to avoid putting all eggs into S3, but how portable is your application logic? And is that a concern for anyone uh, but me? I think it's a concern, but I think also I think it, I think it's a concern for us to not take advantage of these cloud development paradigms. So you know, I I you know, it's my understanding that the other other major cloud providers do offer serverless options. So I think if you know our organization decided to move away from AWS or to go to some kind of multi-cloud hosting, hopefully the the kind of abstractions that we're doing to take advantage of this would still have equivalent support um, over in those um, other environments. I mean, it's actually interesting. Merit is old enough as a system that um, some of the ab abstractions we have in place, like uh, the way our storage service works, um, it was designed for precursors to cloud storage. Um, and so we're just at a point now whereby assuming we're always going to be using cloud storage, we're able to uh, remove some legacy dependencies. Uh, but, but I think it's, I think it's wise, particularly for cloud storage that we're, you know, we don't have all the eggs in one basket there. But uh, I think to imagine us, um, you know, 
being able to run a hybrid of multiple cloud providers, not cloud storage providers, cloud compute providers is just, that's, that's um, yeah, that's a bigger undertaking. I don't think we're at that point yet of even imagining that. Okay, anything else? Thanks very much, Terry and Eric. This is um, mind stretching for me. I don't know how <laughs> if that's true for everybody, but it definitely is for me. So I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, and as far as NDSA business goes, we'd like to try to make sure that we pass on information from um, the leadership and I just wanted to make sure, and you would have seen both of these things on the listserv, but just to, to point them out. Uh, first of all, you may have seen that the uh, Digital Preservation Coalition announced the finalists for the Digital Preservation Awards for 2020. And um, the, the team in, the, in the, the levels of preservation team uh, is one of the nominees, so uh, big uh, kudos to everybody who was involved in the um, levels of preservation rewrite uh, and reboot. Um, we will see how that all works out. And then the coordinating committee has um, nominees have been announced for the coordinating committee. So uh, membership organizations will be getting ballots. So um, the bios for each person who is nominated is up on the site. So you can take a look at that and, uh, and be ready to vote. And Matt, did you uh, have any thoughts about um, whether we need more input for future meeting topics? Well, we um, so have reached out to some other uh, potential presenters. Um, we don't have anything secured for October um, just as of yet, um, but we can still do some uh, work in the background to get in touch with, um, with potential presenters for the topics from our Triceter poll um, and get back to folks. And um, if uh, anyone you know in the mix here um, emphatically wants to hear of a specific topic and or hear from a specific presenter or presenters, feel free to reach out to Lee and I uh, and we can run those folks down. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise, I think we're planning on um, foregoing a meeting in November um, because uh, DigiPres uh, will be coming around um, the virtual digital preservation conference uh, and uh, they do have a keynote speaker secured. Uh, I think there's some updates that Courtney and the planning team are set to push out here shortly. Um, all of the presenters should be hearing uh, back from the planning team here shortly as well. Um, and then December, I think uh, we just have slated for a bit of a debrief recap on everything we've covered so far this year. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be ready to launch into 2021. Um, and uh, we can probably do some polling for um, check-ins on additional topics that folks wanna explore in the new year um, well in advance of December. So other than that, I think that's that's about all I've got. Okay. Um, any questions, comments about any of this from anyone on the call? Okay, well, thanks again, Terry and Eric. That was, uh, was very interesting. I <laughs> will be going back to the video probably multiple times. <laughs> so, and that should be up Hopefully within the next couple of weeks, it'll be online in the NDSA YouTube channel. So, okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank yeah, thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right.